Hello everyone, I'm Daniel Birnbaum, um, a curator and writer, and I've been involved with the Verbia Art Summit since its very beginning. Four years ago, I came up with a theme. We called that year's summit More Than Real, Art in the Digital Age. Today, we're going to discuss themes of technology and virtual possibilities in the arts, perhaps digital possibilities, but through the lens of ecology. So the theme today is sustainability in the digital age. In a way, it's um, the same conversation uh, that we began many years ago, but with two new great guests, a major thinker of our era and a very, very visible and I think super important young artist. I think, Simon, you're still very young, at least compared to me, <laughs> and, and who has shows all over the world. So we have Tobias Rees, who is the founder and CEO of TOF.org. He is currently a, a fellow of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, and he holds degrees in philosophy, anthropology, and neurobiology. All of that is very important, but even more important is that he is a fantastic writer and I think a key thinker of our moment. Simon is an artist from New Zealand, but he's based in Berlin. He's an artist who has made important exhibitions lately that unpack the social and political implications of the technology industry and the rise of social media, startup culture, blockchains, and cryptocurrencies. And he uses a variety of media, including installations, sculpture, print, and video. I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about something I remember that we spoke about uh, some years ago in, in Verbier, uh, namely the, the, the question whether art anticipates things or if it reacts more to technical changes. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about these questions. Technologies make possible new ways uh, of communicating art and maybe it even changes what art can be, the ontology of art. But technology, of course, doesn't just emerge. Uh, you know, someone came up with it. And, and, and I have the feeling that sometimes our, our artists anticipate possibilities before they're fully, you know, fully there. And um, philosophers, of course, uh, are thinking about things that are not yet um, fully in place. And I would actually start maybe with asking both participants to say a little bit about their present work. Sure. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, really an honor to be in dialogue here. There's been some very interesting conversations. I've followed the the summit over the years and um, it's really a pleasure to participate and great to meet you Tobias also very excited Gosh. to be in conversation um, so I'm just going to share my screen because um, I've prepared a few images I'm an artist first and I think I kind of think often through images this is exactly uh, Daniel like some summarizing some of the things I've been doing recently that kind of speak maybe to these themes and I'm going to start with a project that I began in 2019 uh, called mine um, which was yeah, I guess trying to look at the paradigm of different types of extraction that happened. And I guess this is very much in, in dialogue with uh, with kind of thinking about climate and thinking about resources and thinking about use. Um, and uh, this is the lead image we use for that project, which started in Australia, which is a country that obviously like uses a lot of resources um, and uh, also people in charge of that country kind of frame a lot of resource uses. I'd been thinking about... Um, this book by Shosanna Zuboff, uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, where um, she highlighted uh, uh, the kind of human experience as raw material um, for commercial practices uh, and kind of linked that to data um, and to also, uh, I guess, other types of resources that are framed. Um, and I was reading Kate Crawford um, and Vlad Njola um, and uh, talking about the internet interconnections between the literal hollowing out of the materials of the earth and biosphere and the data capture and monetization of human practices um, of communication and sociality and thinking about those things together. And they also underlined in their text and in a diagram they did, which really inspired me, um, how, how hard it is to feel this and how hard it is to kind of understand all of these practices going on at once and how they interrelate and how those kind of patterns of um, extraction kind of proliferate um, through different uh, human systems. Um, and uh, in making this, I, I was thinking a lot about, um, uh, yeah, practices of companies, because that's what I've often been doing. I often start thinking about my work through looking at private companies and, and the kind of histories of activity around private companies. And um, Kate highlighted this drawing uh, that was in an uh, Amazon patent, um, which was literally a container for a human worker 
And I thought, wow, what a monumental um, question about uh, extracting human sociality and labor um, out of systems. Um, and so I collaborated with some great uh, craftspeople to make a kind of giant version of this drawing and then overlaid a little animal onto there, uh, a bird that was becoming extinct. So you could kind of think about labor and life and forms of extraction uh, in dialogue with this company's drawing. Um, that was also in dialogue with other things, looking more literally at like how uh, resources were being extracted. So as we all maybe now know, mines that actually, you know, extract things from the earth are becoming more and more automated. And I made some sculptures out of cardboard um, that uh, models the, the latest uh, systems of um, extraction. So this is a, a drill that is used um, in mines in Australia. Um, and I put that on a kind of a, a format of a, a sales display, um, which was selling a board game that I made. Um, uh, which was sort of modeling some of the some of the economic models which I think contribute to uh, these kinds of systems. So it was based on an old game uh, from Australia uh, modeling the sheep farming industry, um, but I, I overlaid it with uh, with data um, extraction and tried to kind of link some of these things as well. Um, there was a bunch of other stuff in that installation modeling resources onto faces. Um, also mapping how the museum itself extracts data from viewers um, increasingly through using these technologies. When I played this uh, uh, game further and, 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 and traveled this exhibition, I also did a version in Minecraft uh, underneath a, a West German um, uh, mine shaft, uh, which was very important for the industry uh, around the Rhineland um, and uh, the Ruggerbeet. And uh, I made a version of the show in Minecraft. Uh, and also when I, uh, I moved this to New York, I, um, I expanded this to looking at other types of mining that happens, which I also am very interested in, uh, the mining of cryptocurrencies. Um, and by then, uh, NFTs had become a big uh, source of conversation about usage and artists uses explicitly of, um, of energy and how art consumes energy. And I just want to again point to another thinker that um, that I've been kind of following on that. Uh, Carl McDonald, another artist, um, looks at the emissions used on blockchains, uh, specifically the Ethereum blockchain. Most NFT art is made using this blockchain, um, and uh, I made a kind of an NFT that looked at extraction and, and mining and and um, and how we could think about that as artists. Um, I was also curating other art and cryptocurrency projects, which is a, a bit of a um, as Daniel mentioned, uh, this is kind of an emergent um, space at the moment, I think, with cryptocurrency and art. Um, and uh, I tried to connect that also to some of these ecological themes uh, in a show that I curated in dialogue with a bunch of other people in Berlin called Proof of Work. Um, I focused on a work by a distributed gallery, which was literally a money burning machine. So again, thinking about how um, you know, resources and value and labor are spent on, on culture and, and different forms of culture that are tied to different kinds of value. Also um, a collective that I was really inspired by called uh, uh, Terra Zero, which are thinking about using cryptocurrencies and smart contracts so that um, forests can own themselves, uh, which is a really amazing project. Here's a little bonsai version of, uh, of what could be a whole forest that was in that exhibition. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, focusing on that um, all the way through to um, other projects. I, again, this year curated another show called Proof of Stake, a follow up which had, for example, uh, this work in it, which is a, a cryptocurrency uh, and blockchain tracker for uh, B systems called B coin, uh, a very interesting thing where there's literally like a, a, a honeycomb created inside there by bees and, and the blockchain manages and, uh, and tracks what's going on with that. Um, other artists like Sarah Friend uh, creating things uh, where NFTs become life forms, where if you don't give them away, uh, they might die. So thinking again about kind of like those type of strategies. Um, so that gives you a little bit of, uh, of an idea of uh, what I've been doing recently. Thank you, Simon. I mean, actually, a resource hungry could almost be, a, you know, the, the name of one of your shows or something, I feel. I would simply ask you to, to say a few words uh, um, about what you're working on now and, and, um, and possibly a, about the theme. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be in, in conversation with two incredible humans uh, like you. Um, and I'm, you know, before I go into my work, I'm, I'm extremely interested in, in what I feel sort of insecure saying this, what, what I uh, currently think of as Simon's um, 
uh, concept of systems as a kind of analytic uh, that revolves around systems and mining, where a system organizes things, including people, and is always revolving around the logic of extraction, organizing behavior, but also use. Everyone's immersed. There is no one who's outside in a certain way. Um, and it's, a, it's an incredibly powerful analytic to bring things that seem unrelated into view as kind of related. And, and, and uh, um, uh, so I'm a big, big fan and really excited that we, that we can talk about this. Um, my, my work is, is uh, very humble. Uh, you know, I often think that I'm the last generation educated before the internet. So for me, thinking tends to be about the invisible, which is why I often have no slides, just words. Um, in the, in the early 2010s, I had just gotten tenure uh, at the reputable university. I got very, very, very bored with my work. Um, I, I felt uh, the human sciences are based on a concept of the human that we inherited from the early modern age. Humans as more than nature and as qualitatively different from or other than machines. And that this concept of the human, which organizes the university there, the human sciences, the human, there's the you know, natural sciences, nature, and there's engineering, technology, doesn't work anymore. Um, and all the, con the entire vocabulary of the human that we have, art, culture, society, politics, um, civilization, history, is indebted to this concept of the human. Only humans have politics, only humans have culture, only humans have society. And, and um, and so I, I began on I began two projects. I began the project of trying to write the history of this vocabulary of the human. When was it invented? Where did it come from? What purpose did it originally serve? Where does the idea that there is something like the human, something we all share, come from? When was the first universal concept of the human or in its aspiration universal concept articulated? And on the other hand, I was looking for instances in the present that would um, render the human and its vocabulary untenable. So say the microbiome, where does Daniel or Simon end and the microbiome begin when all of the neurotransmitters in your brain are made by bacteria in your gut when, you know, uh, you, you can, it's like a beautiful declination where what kinds of neurotransmitters you have depends on the food you eat. Actually, it depends on what, how the food was produced because if synthetic nitrate is used, etc. you know, it has consequences. So the human as such, as freestanding, as the thing that the human sciences study, is a harmony of illusions. It's completely untenable. And then a, a little more uncanny, uh, machine learning, um, let's say, I don't want to say that this is the same thing as human thinking or human intelligence or human language or GPT-3, but at the very least, the boundaries between the human and the machine is blurred, is, is, is uh, suspended to some degree. And I think the machine concept that we have inherited from the Industrial Revolution clearly no longer serves us to think through the present. So when I began first articulating these ideas, oh, I, I ran into very, very fierce critique. Uh, you know, defenders of the human in the human sciences, of course, the logic of the human sciences depends on humans being more than nature and other than machine. Um, and uh, I had a fearless moment. and decided for myself to point out that most of the critiques of technology and science are actually reactionary on the level of embracing the old concept of the human and defending it against microbes or defending it against machines and became really curious in this, in this blurred space. From my perspective, uh, the question concerning the human has kind of moved out of the faculty of the human sciences and into fields that are not concerned with the human, microbiome research or machine learning. But these fields are not aware of it. So they have philosophical stakes and dimensions, but it's not part of their work. And, and I wanted to build a center where one can study that, where one can build a practice for bringing this into view. And after two or three attempts at universities uh, that failed, I was offered to work at the Berkman Institute. Uh, the project grew there and became so big that, that we could eventually become independent, which is why we now have Transformations of the Human or toft.org in the Bay Area. Um, and and there, is, there is a powerful link to art, uh, and that is um, we, we work with several artists precisely because they actually do philosophical work by inventing products or works, and that's kind of a practice of undifferentiating philosophy, art, and tech, and that's kind of the practice that we want to bring to some tech companies. 
So that's the broader background of our work um, and, and overcoming concepts of technology as the artificial or of nature as the non-technical is, is one significant area of our work. Uh, so we're, we're trying to, to replace technology with biology and, and, uh, or develop the planetary as a practice that unfolds beyond these distinctions with tech companies and startups, actually. So um, I think that, that that's, that's my that's, thought. That's <laughs> great, Tobias. I wanted to ask you something about well, human subjectivity and how how understanding of human subjectivity somehow maybe changes if you look at it through the, the lens of these sciences that you, you mentioned. Um, and also perhaps to, to immediately introduce the, the concept here of, of ecology and ecological threat and the climate crisis, the idea of, uh, uh, of the human subject being finite is something that we have, uh, you know, I also have a, a background in, 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 you know, in philosophy, not like you, but as a, as a student and then as a, you know, someone who wrote a few things, but um, and then I moved on to other things, but the finitude and, you know, that from, yeah, mod, modern, modern subjectivity being finite and all the way up to, let's say, yeah, for instance, the Heideggerian version of it being, you know, that, that you know, it's, it's about being that you will die. You know that the finitude is not just that you're finite in in in, in some sort of spatial sense. Be you know you will die. It it will end. Are we now in a situation where we have to think about finitude for the whole for mankind itself? Is is that uh, what has happened with the climate crisis when we all realized that it could end? That you know civilization and mankind could actually be finite. We have maybe known that this it will not go on forever. For astrophysicists have said that always, but it becomes so much more concrete. What would you say about, about the ecology and finitude? These are such big questions. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, uh, the one part of me says, uh, if it would end, it would be good for the planet. <laughs> um, uh, probably not a very viable answer. So I, I, I want to make a quick distinction between the subject and subjectivity, which I think is important. So if this idea that humans are subjects in a world of objects, right, which begins at one point, probably in the 1630s with Descartes, where the idea is that only humans are capable of knowledge because they have reason. Uh, they're, you know, that's the raison d'etre of humans, that everyone has equal amounts of reason and can know. And then there's the world that is composed of objects that are basically to be known by humans. So you have two, you have two powerful um, substances, if you will, the human as exempt, so to speak, from the object world and the mere object world on the other side. I think rethinking this, rethinking what it means to be human in terms of, of the world, so to speak, in terms of the world that was once defined as the non-human is a very big task. One clearly cannot do this by holding on to a romantic concept of nature, where nature is the non-human, you know, sort of the Sunday afternoon concept of nature, where, where dad puts the family in the car and drives into the forest and it was good being in nature and now you come home. That will not do. So we, we, have, to, we have to do significant work there. And, and there is a link to subjectivity. R Richard Powers, the writer, once said to me that we have to uh, dehumanize the human genre. And, and I asked him what he means. And he said, well, how, where did we, we petit bourgeois, where did we learn to be human? It's the novel. You know, in the 19th century, five million novels were written. These are the first documents of interiority and subjectivity. We learn how to be human. We read Madame Bovary and then, you know, know what it is to live a life. Um, and we now have to write basically 5 million novels with, that provide a lot of little episodes for how to be human in terms of the non-human. And the overstory was one attempt to do this, basically, pro, you know, write about trees and write about mycelial networks or forests, if you will, and learn to be human in those terms, learn uh, to be human without, you know, being romantic or something like that. So I think one of the things, if, if I add one layer on top and then I'll, I'll I'll, I'll be quiet. Going uh, to, to finitude, for a long time, knowledge of finitude was a human exclusive uh, feature. Only humans, so to speak, knew that they die, and therefore only humans had existence, had this special knowledge. Many, many scientists in, in animal studies or ethology have shown that this is nothing that's specific to humans at all. And B, um, blurring the boundaries between the subjective finitude and possible planetary or species finitude is probably a very good thing and a key step 
on trying to produce experiences, vocabularies for making sense of experiences, then unfold beyond this older concept of the human as a subject, as this thing that is set apart. So this would be one way of trying to answer that. Thank you. Very interesting mm -hmm. how you mentioned, you know, the novel being a vehicle or a kind of a device that makes us understand that we are subjects, basically, or, you know, the role of art there. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, artists sometimes seem to uh, anticipate things to come. This is, may sound very uh, uh, silly, romantic idea of artists being prophetic or something, but, but you know, that uh, and Borges wrote novels or, or short stories that are almost hypertext and Duchamp seems mm -hmm. to have, uh, you know, anticipated certain virtual possibilities. And, and, and you know, it, it was John Cage who said that the art, um, art, the art world or, or art can be like an early alarm system. And I'm thinking, Simon, do you think that the art world now reacts with, with I mean, all the things that are happening right, right now, I guess things are actually changing, that it's somehow um, an early alarm system for how we will change, uh, you know, to life on the planet. And I mean, what, what is your thinking? I mean, what, about, about the future of art and the art world? Very small questions here, sorry. <laughs> but, you know, in relationship to the, to, to the ecological crisis, I mean, all these new possibilities that you are exploring, is this part of an answer? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a hard one to answer, but I, I do think that, um, I, well, maybe to, maybe to say it in very simple terms, on my own experience in my own art world, you know, I think there are many art worlds, there are many actors that kind of use art as a, as a dream to, you know, unpack various different parts of life and culture. And, um, but, but certainly the, the COVID-19 experience um, has, as you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation like radically changed what it has felt like to be an artist and to certainly be in dialogue with other artists and which routes you use to take those conversations etc has has radically changed and I think one's uh, response and I guess kind of sense of uh, responsibility um, about exactly you know what impacts are uh, being had when one acts uh, is is much more a part of conversations that I hear than than used to and indeed i guess i don't know if you agree with this to be as, as well but like you know I've, uh, I, I think many times the COVID 19 um experience has been framed as a part of a climate change experience right it's a it's a, it's a it's you know uh, it, to me it makes sense that it's framed as um as one result of of the world's relations between beings changing um and uh, yeah, and I mean, I think, you know, the, the fact that cryptocurrencies and, and different ways of defining value and framing value and exchange has shifted into things that um, can cross borders uh, without the same logistics um, uh, and, uh, and certainly challenge, uh, I guess, notions of the local and, and, and even kind of uh, nation states uh, ways of framing value um, has been really significant for me in terms of rethinking that. It was already a conversation I was involved in, but it was kind of hypercharged when all of a sudden um, shipping things seemed uh, not only more difficult, but more expensive in the way where there were all sorts of externalities that I guess many peers of mine weren't thinking of uh, when they shipped giant things and went to many places. Um, so I think there's been a, a huge shift of focus and um, at once like a broadening of format and opportunity and conversation, a shift in focus on, on what is um, what is very obviously visible. I think, again, organisms other than the human have become so much more visible. Um, but yeah, and again, maybe one thing to to add on to this one book that I was reading over the over the last few weeks is David Graeber's, uh, you know, posthumous release. Again, uh, maybe talking to some of Tobias's um, prompts earlier about um, where those uh, Enlightenment ideas uh, in Europe were kind of focused on and formed in dialogue with other ways of life um, at another moment in rupture in terms of globalism and understanding, you know, the self and politics in relation to, to the global. So uh, dialogues between indigenous systems in North America, obviously having like a huge um, impact on, uh, you know, the Enlightenment and, and those kinds of uh, conversations. And I guess coming from New Zealand, indigenous ways of seeing things and 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 valuing the subject and the self and you know culture it's, and and ways of valuing things and 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 humans and non-humans um has always been kind of like uh foregrounded in my uh thinking as well so maybe and that's can a I, I have two quick reactions if if that's okay with you daniel sure. uh one is um 
Very quickly, yes, I, I, I'm deeply convinced that the encounter with non-European life forms is what basically cracked open, if you will, uh, the, the medieval metaphysics that, that organized Europe. Um, and I, I do think that there was a brief moment of powerful decentering, but the invention of the philosophy of history, where we were all part of nature and then there is progress, basically eradicated it right away, which is why, why I'm hesitant to, you know, to subject myself to local ontologies, but trying to find um, conversations like Yukui does with individuation of thinking or cosmo techniques or, or being in conversation with non-European conceptual histories is key. There's, there's another thing about crypto that I think is really powerful. Cryptocurrencies are global, but not planetary. They're global in the sense that they participate. So they have the potential to break with this distinction between human nature technology, powerfully so. They have the potential to break with the negative version of the concept of society as Foucault or Arndt uh, critiqued it. But they do not pay attention to that aspect of their work very much. So strangely, they're global, almost in a, in a financial sense of the 1990s but they're not planetary. Uh, they continue to operate on the level of extraction. That is actually precisely what they had the potential or have the potential to get away from. And so that would be a perfect tough project, work with cryptocurrency companies and try to ask, how could you move from being global to being planetary? What would that actually mean? Um, and maybe like lean into those claims also that, that are always there about the planetary computer system. And this is one of the one of the early descriptions of a project like Ethereum was exactly using those terms, right? And but right. like you say, often the often the, the the follow through on the claim became something else. I mean, you don't have to be Michel Foucault to understand that if you lock uh, everyone on the planet into their own apartments. You invent a few new uh, mediums. You invent a new uh, way of, you know, uh, you know, value systems, new currencies, and on top of that, a kind of ecological crisis. Things will change institutionally and very deep. And uh, uh, disruption is a word that people, you know, use a lot. What would you say? I mean, every so every generation thinks that they live in very interesting uh, in a very interesting moment, but. What do you think we live in a particularly transformative moment right now? My answer is, is mildly modifying the question. And that is, I, I, I hope so. I'm working very hard to make that possible. <laughs> That's a great, actually, you know, a way to summarize. <laughs> I mean, a great a last statement. Uh, Simon, you have been looking into these disruptive moments since I got to know you a long time ago. Uh, has have things become even more radically disruptive? Yeah, I mean, I think I, you know, I, I I really like Tobias's twist on that, and I also want to um, to couple onto another statement that you mentioned there, Tobias, as well about um, uh, working with uh, people that are developing these systems in order to do you know uh, more interesting things than would happen without other conversations. And I found people working in blockchain particularly open to questions actually that there are there are curious bunch of people those who i've encountered building those systems who are really uh, keen to have high level conversations and 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 consider the questions that i think we're asking right now but maybe uh, to, to come around to what you said daniel i think for me um, and certainly for people i know i think um in in the art world that i grew up in it feels like especially with the dialogue coming with nfts and and in some ways like new canons being built um with new buyers, new consumers, uh, new infrastructures, I think it's a very, very exciting time to be in, in art I, production. Yeah, um, I, I agree. And it's very clear from listening to you that we need a full week in Verbier together <laughs> so that we can yeah. kind of explore these themes. There's no way for me to summarize. You've opened so many doors. So I'd simply say, thank you so much. Thanks, Tobias. Thanks, Simon. I enjoyed this very much. Mm -hmm.